Good evening and welcome. I'm Azazel, and tonight we will be discussing Aokigahara, allegedly one of the most haunted spots in Japan, and one of, if not the most well-known haunted location in Japan to Western audiences. Infamous as a popular location for distressed Japanese to travel to to end their lives, it has become a site of countless alleged ghostly and other paranormal encounters. Numerous movies, books, magazines, music, and games have been made concerning the forest by both Western and Japanese media and entertainment. In this episode, we will start with tales of paranormal encounters in and around Aokigahara, before moving on to the many urban legends about the forest, including differences between how the forest is presented in Western and Japanese narratives. And finally, we'll try to peel back some of the sensationalism around the forest to get a glimpse at the real Aokigahara. We'll discuss the history of the forest, and along the way we'll debunk some of the legends and myths and attempt to ascertain where some of the narratives about Aokigahara come from. Today on Ghostly Japan. Aokigahara is a forest located a little over 100 kilometers to the southwest of Tokyo. The so-called Sea of Trees is situated at the northwest base of Mount Fuji. Aokigahara is infamous both within Japan and internationally for being a destination for Japanese people seeking to end their life. Sensationalized by both Japanese and Western media, the forest has developed a dark reputation, with numerous urban legends and claimed paranormal encounters being reported. In this section, we will discuss the various types of hauntings that are said to occur in and around the forest. One of the most common claims from those who have visited the forest is the sensation of feeling someone, or something, tugging on one's clothing or gear. This is commonly accompanied by claims from the person's companion of catching a glimpse of ghostly white hands reaching out from the ground or bushes and grabbing at the person who had experienced the phantom pull. These types of experiences are a fixture of stories that involve the Japanese self-defense forces, who operate a land nav class through parts of Aokigahara as part of the ranger course conducted at the nearby Fuji School, located on JGSDF Camp Fuji. The person telling the story usually claims to either have been in the class themselves, or knows a friend who was. The story goes that the students were making their way through Aokigahara, when the soldier at the head of the column begins feeling someone tugging at his pack or clothes. The soldier initially ignores it, thinking that the other troopers in his class are hazing him. Eventually, the pulling gets to be too much, and the soldier snaps, turning around and angrily shouting at his fellow comrades to knock it off, only to find the rest of the group standing back some ways with a look of terror. When he asks what's going on, they explain that they've been watching in silent horror the entire trip as pale arms reached out and grabbed at him, and they were too frightened to say anything. A variation of this story starts in a similar fashion, but when he confronts the other soldiers, they express disbelief at his statements about feeling something grabbing him. That is, until midway through the confrontation, the other troopers witness a ghostly arm reach out from behind the angered trooper with their own eyes. These types of stories are not limited to the military, as similar accounts come from civilian hikers as well. Another common report from visitors is hearing voices calling out to them. Sometimes the phantom voice comes from behind the hikers, and other times it emanates from somewhere deep in the forest. The voice is usually calling out for help over and over desperately, or sometimes is a high-pitched scream. If the hikers are brave enough to follow the source of the voice, they find something left behind, like a teddy bear, shoes, a wallet, backpack, a bouquet of flowers, or other offering. Something left behind or otherwise tied to someone who took their own life at that location. In some accounts, the discovery is of a much darker nature, a corpse. Such was the case for a reporter for the Japan Times. While on assignment writing a story on the forest, the reporter heard a terrible scream coming from the woods. Thinking that someone was in trouble, he made his way towards the source of the screams. 
Shortly after the screams suddenly stopped, he found the body of a man. Based on the decay, the reporter said the man had been dead for some time. For some visitors, it's not the voices that they hear while they are at Aokigahara that trouble them, but the voices that they didn't hear until they reviewed footage taken during their trip after the fact. There are a number of cases where voices were captured on film or in recordings that visitors didn't seem to notice while they were in the forest. And for others, full-blown apparitions are reported. A woman in white garb walking through the trees is a frequent reported sighting. Other sightings are more ambiguous, where witnesses are not sure if they saw a ghost or a flesh-and-blood person walking through the woods, leaving them to wonder if they should call the authorities. It isn't just everyday visitors that have had strange experiences in the forest. A number of television documentaries and parts of some films have been shot in the forest. The prefectural government is reluctant to provide permission to shoot within the forest if the project in question might arguably lead to an increase in self-harm in the forest. With that said, some of the crews who have shot in the forest have reported strange events. In one case, while the crew was filming a scene in the forest, a loud, strange noise echoed out from somewhere in the forest, audible to the entire cast and crew. Fearing the shot had been ruined, they reviewed the film only to find the phantom sound had not been captured on their equipment. In the 2012 Japanese film titled Aokigahara, it is claimed that a ghost is caught on film. The film was initially set to be shot in Aokigahara, but permission was rescinded after the authorities learned more about the plot of the film. The film was instead shot in a nearby forest, but apparently Aokigahara's paranormal reach extends beyond the borders of the forest. In the film, the main character joins a group of volunteers sweeping the forest for bodies of victims. In a scene where the search group is scrambling up a steep hill, the search group's leader turns to call out to those behind him. The scene is framed, showing the actor reach the top and turn to call out. When he turns, a figure wearing a yellow-colored top is seen to momentarily peek out from behind a tree to the left of the actor, before sinking back behind the tree out of view. In interviews with the director after the film's release, the director asserts that the figure is not a member of the production staff or an extra. As proof, he offers up that the mysterious figure is wearing a yellow top, and he claims that since the main character wears a yellow jacket in the film, extras were prohibited from wearing yellow-colored clothing so as to not be mistaken for the main character. Additionally, he puts forth that he believes if it was a production member, they would have caught the mistake during editing and fixed it in post. Supporters of the theory that it's a genuine ghost also point out that while the figure of the body is clear, the face appears distorted and appears slightly disjointed from the body. The reports of strange going-ons are not limited to just the forest. Route 139, which cuts through the forest and then runs along the northern and western edges, is also a hotspot of paranormal encounters. Drivers on this road have reported a number of terrifying experiences. One of the most common reports comes from those who make the trip late at night, when there are hardly any other cars on the road. A typical claim will have the unlucky driver pulling up to a deserted intersection, waiting for the light to turn green. However, the light doesn't change, and the confused and annoyed driver begins wondering if the light is inoperable or if they should just run the red. In some accounts, the driver is suddenly startled by the appearance of a ghostly figure at their driver's side window, and in others, a ghostly figure appears at the forest's edge and begins approaching the car. Sometimes the light turns green at this point, and in others it doesn't. In either scenario, though, the driver speeds off in terror, leaving the ghostly figure in the dust. Some drivers have also reported the sudden appearance in the rearview mirror of a ghostly woman sitting in the back seat of their car, but when they turn around, find no one there. Another claim is drivers reporting seeing a mysterious, smiling individual standing at the forest's edge. Inexplicably, the same smiling person will be seen at some distance down the road, and continues appearing again and again along the road for the increasingly terrified driver until they exit the forest. There are a great many urban legends that revolve around Aokigahara, 
and there are some notable differences in how the Force is portrayed in Western versus Japanese narratives. We'll start by covering what is common in both portrayals. Starting with probably what is the central core of this whole thing. We have the claim that the Force is haunted by the Yude, the spirits of those who have committed suicide in the Forest. It is said that those who die violently or who are not given a proper burial are especially likely to become Yude. In some accounts, it's claimed that those Yude then lure other at-risk individuals to the Forest to perpetuate the cycle of death. One will sometimes come across plastic tape, string, or rope strung out in the forest. It is said that these are left by people who came to commit suicide but were unsure of their conviction, so they left these ropes or cords so that they could easily find their way back out of the forest should they decide to live. According to one urban legend, if you find one of these cords and follow it, only to find that the cord has been severed, it was Yude who severed the cord to trap the person in the forest. It's also sometimes claimed that the forest is devoid of life, that there are virtually no animals in the forest, and when walking through the forest it is absolutely silent, save for the whistle of the wind through the trees. Another claim shared by both narratives is that compasses and GPS do not work in the forest. Some accounts attempt to provide an explanation by noting that there is a high iron content in the ground. Tied in with the difficulties in navigation, it is also mentioned that it is very easy for one to lose their way and get lost in the forest. This is where the narratives diverge. The differences start with the names that are attached to the forest. In western blogs, articles, and videos, Aokigahara is often called the Suicide Forest or the Demon Forest. These are names that are almost completely absent from the Japanese side. In Japan, the forest is called either by its actual name Aokigahara or Jukai, which is often translated to Sea of Trees. The Sea of Trees name is said to come from the appearance of the forest from overhead on a windy day. The canopy of the forest swaying in the wind is said to look like waves on an ocean. Both terms are often used together as well, Aokigahara Jukai. The only mention of suicide forest I found on the Japanese side was in articles talking about Western visitors and their perceptions of Aokigahara. We'll continue with some elements found in Japanese accounts before diving into the Western narrative. Some Japanese accounts of Jukai take the alleged navigational difficulties of the forest a bit further and ascribe a certain paranormal power to it. In addition to non-functional compasses, they claim that all electronics, and even cars, have problems in the forest. Digital watches are said to either not work at all or display the incorrect time. It is sometimes claimed that aircraft are prohibited from flying over the forest for this reason. An often stated line is that if you stray out of sight of the road or main trail, that you will never be able to find your way out of the forest. In some tales, this is taken to the extreme where supposedly even the sun becomes fixed in position in the sky, prohibiting the desperate lost soul from even using the sun to determine a crude bearing. Damned to wander a forever twilight forest with no escape until they eventually succumb. Another common claim is that it isn't just the Yude you have to worry about, but that there are vicious roving gangs of wild dogs that will attack people in the forest, and if the dogs don't get you, the bears will. If that wasn't enough, it is also sometimes claimed that a serial killer stalks the forest, preying on those who come to the forest to take their own life. This killer satisfies his own dark impulses by killing them before they can kill themselves. Another common claim is that there is a secret village or community living in seclusion deep within the woods. According to this legend, sometimes those who come to the forest to commit suicide find they cannot go through with the act after all, but still can't find it within themselves to rejoin society. These individuals choose to remain in the forest and eventually formed a small village where they live their lives away from the judgment of society. In some of these accounts, the village is located in a long-forgotten World War II-era bomb shelter or bunker. The residents of this reclusive village patrol the woods for others like themselves, and even try to rescue those who have harmed themselves, bringing them back to their village to live with them. It is claimed that the local police are aware of the village, and actively work to conceal their existence by intercepting outsiders who try to go too deep into the forest, 
and by driving away dangerous animals from the forest. Another slightly similar claim made is that there is a mysterious new religious camp deep in the middle of the forest. This reclusive religious group is located far off the beaten path, deep in the center of the forest according to the tale. It is also claimed that if you attempt to cut down or even just kick a tree in Jukai, that you will be cursed. It's alleged that those who attempt to cut down trees in the forest will die under suspicious circumstances shortly afterwards. Our final claim for the Japanese side is a bit different. It is claimed that one of the caves in Aokigahara leads to a very long tunnel which connects to another cave in Enoshima, 80 kilometers away. In western narratives of Aokigahara, it is often claimed that ubasute was practiced in the forest in the past. We covered ubasute in a previous Ghostly Japan video, but as a quick reminder, it is the alleged practice of abandoning elderly on mountains or other remote locations to die after they reach a certain age. The only mention of ubasute in relation to Aokigahara that I could find in Japanese sources was a passing reference in a blog post discussing the author's paranormal experiences at Hitoana, a nearby cave to the south of the forest, where the author mentioned that ubasute might have been carried out at this cave in the past. It is also often claimed that Aokigahara has a long history in Japan of being haunted by yurei demons and even yokai. Additionally, it is stated that the first recorded suicide was in 1340 by a monk named Shokai, who did so according to a ritualistic Buddhist practice called Nujo. The main overarching difference between how Aokigahara is depicted in the West versus within Japan is that in Western depictions there seems to be a tendency to claim that there is a long-standing historical connection reaching back to antiquity of the force being regarded as cursed, haunted, or otherwise having some dark past. Whereas within Japan, there is a tendency to focus only on the more recent phenomena and its alleged paranormal activity. Rarely do Japanese commentaries attempt to link what is happening now in Jukai to something from the distant past. Additionally, Western depictions tend to only discuss alleged spirits or supernatural beings in the forest, while Japanese discussions tend to include a greater variety of anomalous and esoteric events. Aokigahara was formed roughly 1200 years ago in the aftermath of the Great Jogan eruption. In 864 CE, Mount Fuji erupted for 10 days. A report to the governor of Kai province is preserved in the Nihon Sandai Jitsuroku, a historical chronicle created in 901 CE. In the report, it said that a stream of lava swept down from the northwest side of the mountain. The enormous volume of lava erased entire communities and villages from the map. And finally, the devastation reached the lakes of Motosuko and Seinoumi and was threatening Kawaguchiko. It's reported that as the lava approached the lakes, the water began to heat up to the point that all the fish and turtles died. The volume of lava filled so much of Seinoumi that it split the lake into two smaller lakes called Saiko and Shojiko, which remain today. The reports talk of the ash and dark clouds, making it difficult to even make out the fields from the mountains. Although now separated by Aokigahara, it is believed that the three lakes, Saiko, Shojiko, and Motosuko, are connected by underground waterways as the water level always equalizes between the three. This has led researchers to believe that Motosuko was also once part of the ancient Seinoumi, possibly as late as the Jomon period. It was on this volcanic rock that the forest of Aokigahara sprouted up from, and also provides an explanation for some of the unusual features of the forest. There are few large trees in Aokigahara, with most of the trees being shorter and thinner than one might expect. This is due to the fact that the soil is not particularly deep, and is sitting on top of a layer of volcanic rock. Thus the trees are unable to develop the deep root systems needed to grow larger. It's also given as a reason for why there seems to be so many trees that have toppled over. The rough, uneven ground is also a result of the volcanic origin of the forest. This rough, uneven ground with the thin, uniform trees might be partially the reason for why some find Jukai to be disorienting. The volcanic origin of the forest has also left it with a number of caves and lava tubes, two of which, the Fugaku Wind Cave and the Narusawa Ice Cave, have been set up as an interpretive site for tourists to visit. 
the latter of which is famous for its spectacularly massive icicles. There are also a number of campgrounds just off Route 139, and also some hiking trails, promenades, and paths that cut across the forest. But despite the natural beauty of the area, the one thing the forest has become famous for, like a massive dark grey cloud hanging over the area, is the fact that people come to the forest to commit suicide. It's not known for sure when exactly people began to come in numbers to the forest for this purpose, but it is generally accepted that it began some time after the publication of Seicho Matsumoto's novel Nami no To, or Tower of Waves, in 1961. In this fictional story, the main character eventually decides to end their life in Aokigahara. Some bodies recovered in the forest have been found with the novel in their possession. There are some that assert the real-life suicides predate the publication of the book, but there is no clear consensus on when the phenomena began. Authorities stopped publicly disclosing the number of suicides per year since it's believed it was helping to fuel the phenomena, with the last year being 2003 when 105 bodies were recovered. They have only broken their self-imposed moratorium on a few occasions, the most recent being at the beginning of the pandemic when they reported an uptick in bodies recovered and wanted to bring attention to it. There has been a concern about a possible increase in so-called dark tourism in recent years. Tourists that come to Aokigahara specifically to find corpses, or even worse, to loot them. But the extent of such activities are not well documented. In any event, such individuals are likely to leave disappointed, despite some sensationalist claims that the center of the forest is dense with corpses, most bodies are recovered no more than 15 meters from access points to the forest, and the vast majority of visitors to the forest never encounter a body. Given the size of the forest and the number of possible victims, your odds of running into a corpse are very low. The authorities have gone to great lengths to dissuade people from committing suicide. The signs at the trailheads urging people to rethink their decision have been made famous. Some of the local shopkeepers also are said to try and intercept and talk to people they believe are there to harm themselves. From the government to the local businesses, a lot of effort has been expended to try to get people to stop associating the forest with death and suicide, and to make the area known instead for the natural beauty it has to offer. Next, we'll try to shed some light on the legends about Aokikahara and whether they have any basis in reality. But before we do that, as far as the reports of ghosts in the forest, we can't really prove or disprove that. Ultimately, either you believe ghosts are real or you don't. If you believe such things are real, the history of the location, coupled with the sheer number of reports from a wide variety of sources, makes a compelling argument for it being haunted. On the other hand, if you're a skeptic, it's hard to dismiss the notion that many of the reports from media, whether that be a YouTuber, blogger, or movie production crew, are self-serving. After all, what better way to drum up buzz about your upcoming film or video than to say you actually ran into a ghost yourself? And of course, there are countless people, the vast majority if we're being honest, that visit the forest and never report any paranormal activity at all. Our first claim we'll examine is that there is a massive tunnel or cave from Aokigahara to Enoshima. Simply, there is no proof of this at all. This claim probably came from the fact that there are many caves and lava tubes under the forest, but there is no evidence of any reaching out that far. The forest is devoid of life. This claim is pretty easily disproven. The forest is an important breeding ground for a number of bird species, and is home to bears, boars, deer, foxes, squirrels, and many other mammals. In total, 42 species of mammal have been identified in the forest. This claim probably originates from the experience some visitors report of the forest being completely quiet while hiking through it. There are a number of possible explanations for why the forest would become silent. Anything from animals hibernating due to the season, to just simply animals perceiving the hiker as a predator and becoming silent as a prey response. In any case, the forest has a wide variety of life in it, and a number of interpretive sites are set up in the forest for the purpose of wildlife education. As for dangerous wildlife, this urban legend is probably based on reports from some of the body recovery teams that on occasion suicide victims' bodies are found to have been fed on by bears or other animals in the forest. These feedings are reportedly all after the person has died, 
to my knowledge, a predatory feeding has never been reported. And although the legend of wild roving packs of dogs persists, no photos or evidence has ever surfaced. Then we have the claim that compasses and GPSs don't work, and the more extreme version that extends that to all electronics. This claim is largely false. It would be counterproductive for the Japanese self-defense forces to set up a land nav course to learn how to use said compass and GPS in an area where such things are inoperable. Not to mention the countless hikers, media crews, and others who have used GPS cameras and phones in the forest. However, this claim is not entirely made up. There is a sliver of truth to it. There are isolated small areas within the forest where higher concentrations of iron in the ground left over from the eruption have been shown to have an effect on compasses. This has been demonstrated on a number of Japanese documentaries. However, this effect is small, a deflection of only a couple of degrees on the compass bearing. Over long distances, this error could prove problematic for navigation, but since the affected areas are relatively small, in reality, as long as one ensures to check their bearing periodically, the problem is easily overcome. In any event, the effect on the compass is so small that it will not prevent one from establishing a crude bearing and walking in a straight line to exit the forest. The claim that aircraft are prohibited from overflying the forest is also false. As aircraft routinely do in fact fly over and can be heard when in the forest. Some sightseeing services also offer flights around to see Fuji and the five lakes around it. The claim may be partly influenced by the crash of BOAC Flight 911 on March 5, 1966, when the aircraft encountered clear air turbulence and crashed on the eastern side of the mountain near Gotemba. The claim that there is a serial killer that stalks the forest is almost certainly false. While I can't definitively prove it, if we accept that it's very unlikely to encounter a corpse in the forest on any given visit, as a serial killer you would not only have to intercept that particular individual but do so before they kill themselves. Seems like a very difficult way to find victims if you were a serial killer. The basis for this legend may come from the fact that some murderers have been caught attempting to conceal their victims' bodies in Aokigahara. In December of 2010, three men murdered a 41-year-old man in Aichi Prefecture, then dumped his body into the forest. And then in March of 2015, the bottom of a female murder victim was found. Her murder was eventually tied to a man from Tokyo. In all cases, though, the murder itself was not carried out in Aokigahara. The urban legend that a village of people who survived their suicide attempt or otherwise are outcasts exists hidden deep in the forest is a persistent one. This premise even became a movie directed by the same guy that made Juon the Grudge in 2021. It's a pretty safe bet to say that such a place, as depicted in the legend, doesn't really exist. In this day and age, with satellite photography, drones, and everyone having a smartphone, someone would have discovered the village by now. Having said that, there is a village in the middle of Aokigahara, sort of, and it's almost certainly the origin of this urban legend. We're talking about the village of Shojin, sometimes also referred to as the Guest House Village, Minshuku Mura. Located just off of Route 139, this small village is almost entirely surrounded by Jukai. The villagers mostly operate a number of inns and guest houses for visitors. The villagers had previously lived in villages that used to be next to Shojiko and Saiko. However, a typhoon in 1966 severely damaged their community, so the decision was made to rebuild on higher ground inside the forest. The rumors of hidden village within Jukai began to gain steam in the early 2000s, right around the time commercial satellite imagery was becoming more accessible, and before applications like Google Maps were widespread. Imagery of the small community of Shojin surrounded by trees was spread without context to lend credibility to the tale. Current proponents of this urban legend will often dismiss this explanation that Shojin is the origin of the tale as part of a cover-up conspiracy, and that the real Jukai village is still out there somewhere. As for the claim that there is a mysterious new religious group in the forest, this has been grossly sensationalized and is an exaggeration, but it's actually based on a real place in the forest. It's called Kentoku Dojo. 
a small religious site consisting of a small house built in front of a cave, along with some religious monuments. To understand why someone would build such a place in the middle of the forest and why, we have to look back to history. Mount Fuji has been regarded as a sacred mountain since antiquity. While Mount Fuji has not erupted in 300 years, it had been more active in the centuries prior. Some of the earliest shrines built around Mount Fuji were done with the intent to appease the mountain and prevent eruptions. Due to its sacred status, women were forbidden from walking on the mountain. Shugendo, which is a religion that according to legend was founded by a mystic named Enno Gyoja sometime in the late 600s, was a belief system that blended aspects of Shinto, Buddhism, and local folk belief. Shugendo followers preached asceticism and considered mountains to be a sort of sacred middle ground with the spirit world. By conducting religious rituals of various sorts near or in these areas, the followers could receive special powers to address a wide variety of problems in the earthly realm. In the early 1600s, a new sect would be formed from Shugendo called Fujiko. Based on the teachings of a Shugendo ascetic named Kakugyo, this group would focus on worshipping Mount Fuji. Kakugyo is claimed to have completed a thousand days of religious training within a cave near the southern edge of Aokigahara called Hitoana. One of the central practices of the group was to make a pilgrimage to the summit of Mount Fuji. The group enjoyed considerable growth in Edo at the time and organized a number of paths and stations to support their followers' pilgrimages up to the mountain. Physical remnants of this past, in the form of markers, statues, and even old trails themselves, dot the landscape of Aokikahara. The group also constructed Fujizaka, man-made mounds made to resemble Mount Fuji. These mounds were sometimes constructed using actual rock brought down from Mount Fuji. Since Edo was the base for the Fujiko movement, a number of Fujizaka were constructed there, with numerous examples continuing to exist into the present day. These mini Mount Fujis were made to allow those who were not physically fit to make the actual trip to summit Mount Fuji, along with women who were not allowed on the real mountain, to make a symbolic pilgrimage by climbing the mound instead. The prohibition against women climbing Mount Fuji would be lifted during the Meiji Restoration. Fujiko was not the only religious group to revere the mountain. Throughout history, numerous sects, cults, and groups have set up around Mount Fuji. The vast majority are harmless, and if anything, tend to be reclusive in nature. However, one group was distinctly not. The Omu Shinrikyo Doomsday Cult. Infamous for carrying out the 1995 sarin gas attack in Tokyo, and responsible for a number of other attacks as well. The cult established a compound, including a lab in Kamikuishiki, a village on the western edge of Aokigahara. The deadly gas used in the attack on the Tokyo subway system is alleged to have been produced here. The government eventually raided the compound and had the compound completely razed. Nothing of the infamous cult's headquarters remains today but the indelible mark the cult left on the country's collective memory has left a haze of suspicion hanging around the numerous new religions that have set up around Mount Fuji. Going back to Kentoku Dojo, this site is a former Fujiko site, where Fujiko pilgrims could rest and also meditate in the cave. A marker in the cave states that someone completed 50 days of continuous religious training in the cave. Sometime after World War II, a married couple became the occupants of the site. Allegedly followers of a Nichiren Buddhist sect, the couple came to devote themselves to religious training and meditation at the site. At some point in the 2010s, the couple vanished. It is not known for certain where they went. Some believe they simply became too old to continue living in the relative isolation of Kentoku Dojo on their own and moved away. The site now sits abandoned has become the subject of urban legend. Japanese bloggers and YouTubers have documented their own trips to Kentoku Dojo, and the site has developed a reputation in some communities for being haunted. The site consists of a small house and two storage sheds, all of which are locked shut and secured. The house has a prayer scrawled on a piece of paper taped to the outside of it. There is a small outhouse on the premises, however that is not locked. According to those who claim the property is haunted, the outhouse's door is said to open and close on its own and some have claimed to hear odd noises coming from inside the house. There is also a small altar on the path to Kentoku Dojo, which has become famous as a place where ghosts are said to appear in photos or video. Somewhat related to this discussion is the claim that the first suicide occurred in 1340 by a Buddhist monk. 
This claim appears to originate from a 1988 article in the academic journal Suicide and Life-Threatening Behavior, a publication of the American Association for Suicidology. In this article, Yoshitomo Takahashi, a doctor with the Yamanashi Medical College, details his treatment of three patients who attempted suicide in Aokigahara. The main focus of this article is of a psychiatric nature, concerning the three patients' treatment and the alleged amnesia they developed after their attempted suicide. However, the article includes a short introduction of Jukai, since Aokigahara may not have been familiar to Western audiences in 1988. It is in this intro that the statement about the first suicide is found. There are also a few other curious statements made, but there is no citation provided for those. The article cites a 1967 book titled Mount Fuji by Endo H as the source for the claim that the first suicide was in 1340. Tracking this further leads us to a local writer and educator, Endo Hideo. Endo has written extensively on the history of Mount Fuji and the surrounding area. Unfortunately, the book in question, though, is out of print. The article states, The first suicide in Jukai recorded in history was committed by the Buddhist monk Shokai in 1340. It was, however, completely different from an ordinary modern suicide, being known as Nujo, a special form of Buddhist religious ritual. There was a belief that emerged within the greater Shugendo movement that a monk could enter into eternal meditation and become a living Buddha. In doing so, they could rectify some great problem in the world and generally achieve salvation for people of the world. Eternal meditation was achieved by becoming a Shokushin Butsu, essentially a mummy. The arresting of the decay of the body was seen as proof that a state of eternal meditation had been achieved. Monks were motivated to engage in this special kind of nujo during periods of war, famine, or epidemics. The monks who engaged in this eventually developed a sort of protocol or ritual that was said to take about 3,000 days to complete, part of which entailed a dietary restriction called mokujiki. Under mokujiki, cooked foods, meat, and cereal grains were avoided. The diet consisted mostly of specific kinds of wild mountain plants and nuts. This diet would be combined with fasting. In essence, the goal was to begin the mummification process while still alive, and to get rid of as much fat, water, and muscle mass before death, things that would promote the natural decay of the body. There was no single protocol and variations were common. Some monks drank lacquer tea, hoping that it would help to preserve their bodies and help them to become shokushin bitsu. While there were attempts to become shokushin bitsu made in various locations throughout Japan, the majority were concentrated in the Yamagata area. According to records of the process undertaken, when the time was near for the monk to attempt to enter eternal meditation, a large hole would be dug into the ground, in some accounts about three meters deep. A large box would be placed into the hole. A layer of charcoal would then be laid down within the box, before a second, smaller box would be placed inside. It's in the second, smaller box that the monk would then enter. A piece of stripped bamboo would be run from the surface to the interior of the second, smaller box that contains the monk, acting as a pipe or straw. This would then be used for air and also to deliver food and water to the monk. The second, larger box would then be filled with water to create an airtight barrier. Then this contraption would then be sealed and buried. The monk would also have a bell with him, and would recite Buddhist prayers and ring the bell as he did so. This was a signal to his compatriots on the surface that he was still alive. As long as they heard the bell, they would continue providing water and food through the bamboo tube. When the ringing finally stopped, the pipe would be sealed. They would then wait a certain predetermined amount of time. This could be as short as a hundred days to several years. After the prescribed amount of time had passed, the monks on the surface would dig the box up and check to see if their fellow monk had been successful in becoming a shokushin butsu. If he was, then he was enshrined in the temple where he would continue his eternal meditation. If, however, there were signs of rot, then a regular funeral and cremation would be performed for the monk. This practice was made illegal during the Meiji Restoration in 1879. According to legend, the first monk to undergo this process was Kukai in 835. 
although the actual records from that time show Kukai was actually cremated. The claims of Kukai becoming a Shokushin Butsu did not appear until about 200 years after his death. Incidentally, right around the time when the first verifiable Shokushin Butsu began to appear. The first incident we have supporting evidence for dates back to 1003. There is a certain amount of prestige that comes from a sect having founders or members of it having succeeded in becoming Shokushin Butsu, and even today the temples that have enshrined actual Shokushin Butsu will have events centered around the enshrined monk. In some cases the temple will sell amulets to the general public that are somehow enchanted by the Shokushin Butsu. In one temple's case they periodically change the robes of the mummified monk and include small snippets of the monk's robes in their amulets. To bring this back to Aokigahara, other than the 1340 entry of a monk named Shokai, I could only find two others that are said to have performed this act in the forest. That's only three recorded individuals in the forest's 1200 year history. I'm sure there were others that I missed, but I still think that it's safe to say that this was an extremely rare occurrence. Additionally, the only reason they are probably selecting Aokigahara is because of its proximity to Mount Fuji. In one of the two cases I found, this is explicitly stated that that monk had actually intended to attempt to undergo the process on Mount Fuji, but had been rebuffed by the monks that ran the temple on the mountain, who viewed it as inappropriate. It's also unclear if the individuals were successful in becoming Shokushin Butsu. Aokigahara is a damp and moist environment, conditions not exactly conducive for mummification. One last point I'd like to make on the subject. The practitioners themselves did not view this act as suicide. In their worldview, it was a form of meditation, an attempt to reach enlightenment for the benefit of humanity. As far as establishing a history of suicide in Aokigahara, given the intent of the practitioners and the extreme rarity of the practice within Aokigahara, I find it a bit of a stretch to say that a history of suicide existed in Aokigahara prior to the current phenomena. It's only natural for us to want to have an answer for why people come to Aokigahara to commit suicide. There seems to be a tendency, more so in western depictions, to tie the reason to some cultural or historical precedence. But as we've discussed here, the evidence for that is pretty thin in my estimation. Another thing to keep in mind when discussing suicide in Aokigahara is that it is only a small percentage of the number of suicides throughout Japan in any given year, somewhere between half a percent to a very liberal estimate of 1.5%. But why do some people come out to Aokigahara to commit the act? The article mentioned earlier by Dr. Takahashi offers one possible theory. Although suicide itself is a purely individual act, those who gathered in Jukai to commit suicide felt as if Jukai were a sanctuary where suicide was allowed, and a means through which they could receive the same abundant sympathy as that which surrounded previous deaths. They also wished to use the site of previous suicides as the last scene of life in order to share the same space with others and belong to the same group. All three of the patients described here reported that the main reason why they chose Jukai as a suicide site was that they believed that they would be able to die successfully without being noticed. In the end, it might simply be a desire to not burden loved ones and a desire to pass in a location where others who felt similarly have done so. A way of not being completely alone when the end finally comes. In recent years, there has been a renewed effort to combat the root causes of suicide, not just in Aokigahara, but throughout Japan. In 2021, a new minister-level position, the Minister of Loneliness, was created to address the issue of social isolation full-time. Changes to how Japan tackles mental health issues are coming, albeit slowly. At the local level, locals and Authorities have endeavored to change Aokigahara's reputation, but the dark cloud of suicide, ghosts, and urban legends continues to overshadow the natural wonders, scenic vistas, and unique character of the forest. Aokigahara was not always regarded so darkly. With time, perhaps in the future, tourists will once again know Aokigahara for the natural beauty it has to offer. <laughs>